Hi, my name is Bethany. Um, so I've grown up at New Life Church. Um, I might not have met or had a chance to speak to all of you. Um, so I've been at university for the past three years and have only been able to be here in the holidays. So I'm excited to be able to be part of this series looking at the Psalms. Um, the one I've chosen to speak on is looking at Psalm 42. This is a Psalm that's basically talking about what to do when God, it feels like God is a million miles away. Where, what to do when it feels like even though you're seeking God, he just doesn't seem to be there. Um, so just before I get into it, we're just going to look at a bit of context. And um, so unlike the Psalms that come before this, this is not by David. Um, this son is written by the sons of Korah, and they were part of the choir in the tabernacle. Um, so for, for some reason, they can't go to the tabernacle, which was seen as like the place of dwelling or God's temple. And so they're crying out, being like, why, why can't I encounter God? Why can't I meet with him in the temple? And this frustration of wanting to meet God, but feeling like they can't. So we're now going to have the reading of Psalm 42. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the Mighty One, with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you from the land of Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love. At night his song is with, is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by, my, by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taught me, saying to me all day, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my saviour and my God. Great. Um, so now to like unpack this idea of like thirstiness, fulfilment, and what to do when God is far away. Um, so recently, while I was preparing this talk, it was during the heat wave where it was really hot here and like 30 something degrees. Um, so I probably like stupidly decided to go for a run in our local park. Um, and usually when it's quite hot, I'd go for a run and try and like go past the water fountains as I go. And you can get like a quick drink as you run past them. Um, but of course, because of Corona restrictions, all the fountains were turned off. Um, so the run suddenly became a lot harder than I thought it would be as I was expecting to get these like refreshments as I was going but instead there was nothing so it was just a long tiring run wanting to have a drink um, and this idea of like unquenched thirstiness is what this psalm is about it's about the speaker having a thirst and hunger for God but just feeling like they can't find God or can't have this satisfaction in him and while the Old Testament God committed to this idea of being in the tabernacle and in the temple, God was not restricted to this one place or building. Um, by very definition, God can't be contained in a building. He's not limited to one place. So even though the psalmist is lamenting like that they can't go to the temple and encounter God, this does not mean that they couldn't experience God and have God working in them. Um, with everything currently going on in terms of like corona restrictions and lockdown this is maybe a situation we can relate to more literally than usual um, at the moment we can't meet together in a church we can't all have that fellowship on a Sunday and come together and maybe that's starting to take a toll on your faith um, maybe it's feeling like you can't meet with God because you can't have that place of all coming together before him but also more generally, I think this idea of struggling to encounter God and feeling like he's far away is something we all go through phases of. 
There's always maybe times in our lives where it just feels like, God, where are you? Why aren't you here in this situation? Why can't I feel or see what you're doing? And I think a really important place to start with this and a I guess maybe a very simple point about God's character that I personally find I often forget is this idea that God is never in the wrong place. God is never in the wrong place. He is always there. He is always present, even when we can't feel or see it. Um, But the real thing that it comes down to is that we usually aren't spending enough time with him or making enough space for him to realise what he's actually doing and how we can encounter him. Um, So that's what we're going to be looking at today of how do we make space for God to have him satisfy our thirst and hunger and like our desire to have fulfilment in life. Um, And the psalmist seems to get this as they repeatedly ask themselves, um, as it says, like a refrain throughout the psalm, it says, why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? They are asking themselves, why aren't I meeting with God? But they are not asking, why isn't God here? They kind of, even though they realise they can't go to the temple, there's also this realisation that it's, why aren't I meeting with God? Not, why is God not meeting with me? Um, and I think for me, so often the answer to this question is, is I'm just not spending time with God. Of I'm just not giving him time and space to work in my life. Um, maybe it's busyness and that's gradually pushing time of praying or Bible or worshipping God slowly out of our lives. Um, so like the psalmist, we can also make excuses of like, we can't go to the temple, we can't go to the church, and we forget that God is working regardless of the place or situation. He is not restricted. God is never in the wrong place. And when we aren't spending time with God, it's so easy for other things to creep in in our priorities. It's so easy for other things to overtake our time and what we're doing. Um... And it can be hard to then dedicate time to him. And I think it's in these moments where we're most likely to ask God of like, God, where are you? Maybe you can identify with what the psalmist says in verse nine, where they say like, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? And while these are sometimes really good questions to ask, and it's really good to be honest before God and come to him with like all our raw emotion, We've also got to remember to leave space for him to actually answer these questions and to open our eyes to what he's doing. We've got to leave space for us to listen to him, to come close to him and hear what he's saying. Um, This psalm begins by comparing the speaker's need to God or desire to meet with God to a deer that pants for water. It says in verse one, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. And this is kind of coming back to like the basic human thing of all humans thirst for something. We all seek fulfillment and satisfaction somewhere. It is just a question of what are we looking for? Is it in your wealth? Do you seek satisfaction in your career, in grades or results or qualifications? Is it in your reputation, in relationships, in, with your family? Is it with hobbies like sports or music? Is it popularity or busyness? Is it appearance? Is it even things like religion or morality? Is it serving people around you or pleasing them? Or is it any other achievement or recognition this world can offer? And while these things in themselves aren't bad, They are only temporary. They cannot bring us true fulfillment and satisfaction, no matter how much we give to them. Or another way of asking this question is, what are you giving your time to? If someone was to look at your schedule, who would it say, or what would it say it is that you're trying to seek fulfillment in? Everyone is worshipping something. We are all having something that we are giving our lives to. Whether you have a faith or religion or none at all, It's always a matter for everyone of who or what are you worshipping? What are you giving your time to? 
So if you return to the running analogy, it's like running around in the heat, looking from fountain to fountain for some source of satisfaction and finding that the, even ones that maybe give you a brief refreshment, it doesn't last, you are soon thirsty again. Or maybe like my experience, you get there and it's just turned off and it gives you nothing at all. And this is so often what happens when we try and seek fulfillment in things in this world. Is that the psalmist says in verse 3, My tears have been my food day and night. For them it's their suffering and hardship that's completely overtaken their lives. They say in verse 10, My bones suffer mortal agony. It's their pain that's making it hard for them turn, to turn to God. So what is it that you're trying to seek fulfilment in? What's overtaking your life and your priorities? And I'm not saying that we need to ignore pain or block out the chaos of life. That's not it at all. Instead, I'm saying we need to realise truly who God is and realise that he is the only one and the only person we can turn to that can ever satisfy us, no matter what situation our lives are in or how difficult things are. If we look at the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to himself as the water that will satisfy, the water that the deer, like the deer seeks at the beginning of this psalm. In John 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well, and here he calls himself the living water. He says to her as she pulls out the water, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst again. When he feeds the 5,000, he says, I am the bread of life. Come to me and you'll never be hungry or thirst again. At the Feast of Tabernacles, he says that anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Coming to Jesus is the only way we can ever be satisfied. He is the only one who can bring true fulfilment and satisfy our thirst. How often are we running from one fountain to another trying to find something to quench our thirst? But it's just the next thing and the next thing and nothing's quite bringing fulfilment. Is that I constantly have to check myself with this and think about what am I giving my time to? Why aren't I spending more time with God? And for me, it's so easy to be the busyness or just feeling like there are a hundred things to fit into a day and spending time with God just gradually gets delayed and delayed. Or maybe like the psalmist in verse 2 when they ask, when can I go and meet with God? How often do we make excuses for him? How often do we turn to God and say like, God, can't you see I'm busy? Can't you see I'm already short of time? Can't you see I'm doing good things with my time already? And I'm helping people around me. Um, I think even through lockdown in the past few weeks, this is something I've had to be careful of, of of this. Um, I've been helping out at a food bank that's just started running and been trying to do like job applications and keeping up with friends and finish off the ends of my degree at the same time. Um, and I think I was very much saying this to God of like, can't you see God, I'm helping people and like doing good things that would please you. Um, but God isn't asking us to do to do all these things all he's saying is like come to me and find fulfillment he's saying these things are good but if you're not coming to me and seeking satisfaction you're running dry and you won't actually be able to keep going um it's not a case of sitting and intensely trying to think about holy things or make your life all sorted out it's simply about making space and time for god to come it says in verse 4, I pour out my soul before the Lord. This is what we need to be doing, coming to him with all the mess of our lives and saying, here God, I'm coming to spend time and do work with you and chat to you about what's going on. Um, in this psalm, it keeps repeating the phrase of like, my soul is downcast within me. My soul is in pain. And each time it mentions this, it then follows with the solution of like, they talk to themselves and say like, give themselves like a pep talk, like this is what I need to do. Um, in verse six, it says, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you. Um, how often do we forget the things that God has done in our lives, the way he's answered our prayers, the good things he does each day? When things go wrong, it can be so easy to forget the amazing ways that he's been working. A practical way that I try to like tackle this is to keep a list of prayers and answers to prayers I've seen and the good things that God has doing. So that can literally just be like the small and big things. Maybe it's 
people we've seen healed. Maybe it's even things, small things by saying like, God, thank you for the good weather we had. Um, and then just looking back over it and thinking, huff. Um, and this might seem like a simple point, but it's one that I definitely forget, is that the Bible is a book that's literally the history of God's faithfulness through time. It's a book that talks about the God that we get to know who parts the seas, a God who heals the sick and who rose from the dead. And suddenly when we're reminded of these things that God has done, it's a lot easier to trust him with our own situation. In verse 11, when it repeats it again, it says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for yet I will praise him, my saviour and my God. The psalm ends by the speaker saying they will praise God amongst all the suffering and chaos of life. They turn to him and say, You are God, you are my saviour. How often do we forget to praise God for who he is? This is God who is faithful. He is the provider. He is the healer. He is our father. He is the prince of peace. So do we praise God and spend time declaring who he is so that this can like reinforce our fulfillment and satisfaction in him by realizing who God actually is? When we are struggling to find satisfaction and contentment, do we actually turn to God to satisfy our thirst? And it comes down to like at a very simple, basic level of do we give our time to God? It's not complicated. It's not about being holy or sorting everything out and getting your life in order. It's about coming to him in the mess. And I think, thank goodness, that our fulfillment isn't dependent on things that we do or we achieve. Like, thank goodness, it's not us who has to try and sort everything out so that our life feels worthy. All we literally have to do is come to Jesus and say, this is my life, here it is before you, and he does all the rest. He gives us that fulfillment, no matter how tough and hard things are. He can bring that satisfaction into any situation if we simply come to him. When we look at Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, he is saying, find fulfillment in me. Alone you can't have a truly satisfying life or you're missing out on how great it can be. And that's not saying life will be easy, but it's saying come to me and your life will be fulfilling no matter how tough it can be. I think faith is so often a side effect of getting to know an all-powerful, all-loving God. So to end now, I thought there's this passage in the Narnia book, The Silver Chair, um, that kind of, I think, just really summarises this idea of seeking God and being thirsty for him and only seeking satisfaction in him. Um, so it's on the main character, Jill, um, and she's one of the main characters um, in the book. Um, and it's in this moment where her friend's gone missing and she realises that she's incredibly thirsty and that she's got nowhere to go and get water. And so she looks around and comes to this stream, but in front of the stream is a lion. And this lion is called Aslan, and Aslan is um, like a symbol of God and the figure of God. Um, so she eventually approaches him and the stream, and this is what it says. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I am dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I? Would you mind going away a while while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this by looking, by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless box, she realised she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The dish, delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything if I come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come still nearer. Do you eat girls, she said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, men and women, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry, it just said it. I daren't come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. 
There is no other stream, said the lion. And I think this is ultimately what we have to realise, that there is nothing in this world that can match or even come close to matching the satisfaction and fulfilment that we get through knowing Jesus and through spending and giving time to him. It's a time that's never wasted or regretted. It's always worth it. So do we thirst and hunger enough for him? And secondly, do we make space for him to enter our lives and satisfy our every need?